Hello, hello, hello. Happy, happy Thursday. Welcome to Bear Market Brews, brought to you by Hickson Zerker Capital Management. I, I am Tony Hickson. It's four o'clock. The markets are closed. But our virtual happy hour is about to begin. As always, I am joined today by our guests, our venerable and esteemed colleagues, Adam Zerker and Austin Wilson. I invite you to sit back, relax, crack open a bottle of your favorite brew or beverage or water or tea, whatever it is that you like to drink. As we break down all things COVID-19, we will show you how the markets are responding and share our latest views. At the end of every call, we love your questions. There will be a Q&A, so get ready. Here we go. What's up, guys? How you doing? Awesome. We're great. All right. We got you unmuted and ready to roll. <laughs> I am excited. The market closed up. It did. I cannot believe it. Six million unemployed uh, jobless claims, and yet the market's in the green. It's a crazy day. <sighs> We're in I'm weird loving. times, people. Bad news. Bad news is good news. Bad news <laughs> is good news. <laughs> So I uh, want to start off for any of our new listeners that uh, might be joining us for the first time with some introductions. So Adam, let's join up with you. Tell us who you are and what are you drinking? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Adam Zerker. I am Chief Investment Officer and CEO of Hickson Zerker Capital Management. And today I am drinking a Rheingeist Imperial IPA mm. called Knowledge. <clears throat> so, Classic. Great timing for this one, right? Because the can <laughs> says it sharpens perceptive depths in the studious night. So I'm hoping by drinking a little knowledge juice, I will be able to bring you some knowledge that is helpful. We are awesome. excited. We need your, we need your knowledge for sure. <laughs> Austin, you're looking good today, buddy. We'll hey, thank you. I look at this. I did my hair and everything. Wow, how about that? I love I'm just it. Trying to clean up for you guys. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, uh, well, so last I'm, week, I'm sorry. Ahead. Last week we talked about the guitars in the background. Yeah, the what, what's going on in your house? Well, right now, uh, my daughter's asleep, which is a really good thing. But uh, we're doing all right. We're looking forward to taking a walk with the family and the dogs because uh, it's 58 degrees or something like that. So things it's are good in Ohio. It's warm in Ohio. It's gorgeous. Yeah, we're gonna take it and roll with it and keep our social distance if we run into anyone on the sidewalk. <laughs> so Austin, you're a research analyst. Uh, uh, anything else you want to share about yourself? I've been with the firm uh, a little over two years, and this is the most fun bear market I've ever experienced. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Oh, Good and deal. I am drinking the original craft brew, Sam Adams Boston Lager. Boston Lager. It is distinctively complex and balanced, like me. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> awesome. Like well. As I said, my name is Tony Hickson, a uh, partner at the firm. I am drinking a Bell's Oberon American Wheat Ale. It's pretty good. Can't complain. Love it. But what we really want to know is what are you drinking? The chat box on, your, on this software, the Zoom call, is uh, at the bottom of your screen. Click that open. We want to know. Put in there all, pan all participants in the drop down and type what it is that you are drinking. Once we get some of those in, we will, uh, we'd love to hear what it is that you've got. We've got some pomegranate tea, of course. And, uh, you know, Austin, earlier today, we were chatting a little bit. And I believe that we said that um, if we get a thousand attendees on this webinar, what did you say you were going to do again? So if we have 1,000 live attendees on this webinar, I will write and perform the bear market blues. No way. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So make it happen and I'll make it happen. You heard it here. Boys and girls, share the link with those that you know <laughs> and love. I know I'm really committed now because we now it's public. To a thousand Austin's Bear Market Blues will make it live. That's on right. The virtual happy hour. <laughs> Seeing some good comments coming through. A monkey shoulder scotch. That is a great drink. Great Lakes, Amber Lager. Thank you guys for putting that in. Um, let's do a virtual cheers to Bear Market Brews. You're here. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So as I stated, the chat box is to the chat with everyone. 
make sure you hit the drop down. It says all panelists is the default. Hit the drop down and uh, say all panelists and attendees to make sure that all your comments are being shared with those in the brewery today. So the other box that we're, is important is the Q&A box, question and answer. So we're gonna share quite a few bits of information today. Adam's knowledge straight from his can of beer knowledge. into your ears, it's gonna be great. If you have more questions, uh, we want to provide answers, so get those ready to go. Use the Q&A box for that. That will go straight to us and uh, we'll be happy to answer it. All right, so I think we wanted to start off first with Austin giving us a quick update on COVID-19 status. What's going on, Austin? Yeah, well, the funny thing is that things are changing so rapidly that I pulled these graphs together this afternoon and the numbers have already changed. So first of all, let's talk about cases in the U.S. Cases in the U.S. are now over 200,000, which have really, really grown drastically over the last handful of um, days and really the last week. So very, very strong growth we've been seeing in not such a good way. We, these cases growing is, is not necessarily a good thing for us. Mm -hmm. um, we now have the most cases in the world. As we talked about last week, we were actually in third place um, behind China and Italy, and we are now in first in number of cases followed by Italy and Spain. So that is not a great place to be, but we are very confident that we have the most advanced uh, medical professionals and systems in the world, and we're gonna be able to prevail through this, but not great numbers we're seeing so far. So mm -hmm. um, Italy is in second place with 115,000 cases and Spain at 110. So around the world though, the next slide we will see that I predicted a couple minutes ago that cases would exceed 1 million very soon. Well, since this slide was put together, we actually have now exceeded 1 million cases around the world. And uh, nice. so that is, that is a chunk of people infected yeah. with this virus. No fun. No fun. So things are, things are developing, things are spreading, and uh, these are definitely interesting and tough times for the globe. So that is going to continue to go up as testing goes up globally. It's, and also, especially here in the U.S., we are testing more than we ever um, have. So it seems like every day we're testing more and more people. So those numbers are going to go up. If we look at the fatality rate, this is, this is a real serious virus. It does have a, have a real impact. And especially for the certain at-risk groups, it, it has a high fatality rate. So if we look at deaths in the U.S., that's also grown quite rapidly. And those are over 5,000 deaths in the U.S. And that 5,000 represents about 2% of cases um, if you look at both of these, at all of these charts, really, the leveling off is not really a leveling off. That just goes to show that this, the data is really posted to Bloomberg about once a day in really accurate time, and then it'll get updated again. So don't think that we've had a leveling off. That would be what we'd love to see on these cases, but that's not necessarily the situation right now. On the next slide, we see that global cases or global deaths have exceeded 50,000 and around 5% of cases. Now, as more and more people get tested and the number of infected people grows, that percentage should come down on a percentage of fatalities. But it's definitely grown pretty rapidly recently, and uh, we're hoping that that tapers off as well. So unfortunately, with this being a global pandemic with a virus that humans have no natural immunity to, it is going to kill some people and that is a very tough reality that we're dealing with and one of the one of the worst parts of having to deal with this take all the economics out of it the loss of human life is it's real and it's really sad so these are things we're watching but i do want to point out that on a good note people are recovering from this so in the u.s we've had almost nine thousand recoveries and globally 21 percent of people have fully recovered from this at about 120,000 almost so we're excited about that but I wanted to point out one thing that we're watching very, very closely, and that is the case curve. So if we look at the next slide, we will see really the curve is what we're talking about, not necessarily numbers. And the curve is the increasing of cases over time. And this is a logarithmic chart so that all of these different regions, which are kind of the most infected regions, are able to be compared apples to apples. And we see that the red line, the US, with the American flag there, stars and stripes, has been growing at a steeper rate after it got started than most of the rest of the regions here. 
And that is what's causing our cases to grow more and more day after day. And has really put us in the, at the forefront of this pandemic as kind of the leader um, in global cases. So what we want to see is something similar to China in terms of flattening. We want to see the curve flatten over time. Now, there has been some discrepancies, especially within the last week, on whether China's data has been accurate or not. And those are things we'll leave to the experts. But in the U.S., we've got real data, reliable data. We can trust it. And we want to see our cases substantially flatten and really slow the growth. If we can slow that growth, we're going to be able to control things a lot better. Austin, so if I'm, if I'm interpreting this curve correctly, it looks like at this point in the cycle, the number of days since we've each country first had 100 cases, it looks like China had already started to flatten. True. Um, as well as, you know, some of the other countries. Um, why do you think it's taking the U.S. longer than China to see a flattening of the curve? Yeah, well, specifically, some of those countries that flattened a little earlier are countries such as Japan, South Korea, China. And these are these countries in Asia that have a little bit different government situation and the people in those in those countries kind of have a different relationship with their government, where if the government tells them to stay at their house or that this is better for them, that they're just going to do it regardless of what they feel. And it's typically, you know, it's, it works in keeping people out of contact with one another. Um, but something that we have in the United States is an economy that is very, very, you know, integrated with one another. And we're really hung up on our freedom, which we're, we're blessed to have the best freedoms in the whole world. But when we get told not to go do something and not to go out to eat or whatever, it's not a natural thing to just, uh, to just accept and move on and be like, okay, we're going to go stay home for two weeks or a month or whatever. Also, specifically in China, but in general, these Asian countries, they've dealt with these pandemics before and they know what it takes. And that if they just do what they're told and stay put, things are going to settle down on their own, where we really haven't been as impacted by SARS, H1N1, whatever, as they have. So um, we're kind of learning as we go. And I hope we're learning that, you know, and going to be better prepared if this were to happen again. But we're in a definitely different situation than a lot of those other countries. Yeah, I think another interesting, I was, I was speaking with a client this afternoon, and he happened to be in New Zealand. So he, <clears throat> excuse me, he left the U.S., on February 20th, which was right the first day the bear market started, right? So we peaked on February 19th. He was in New Zealand, had some, some plans there. And um, ultimately a couple weeks in, of course, found out that he had to come home. And so to get home, he had to take a flight out of New Zealand into Australia, then Honolulu, and then into Tampa. And every one of those legs of the flight, he got the last flight out. Wow. But so, yeah, he got lucky. He got lucky to get home. But so now he's in Florida. And what I'm hearing him say is that he, he has noticed an extreme, you know, and I think we've all seen it, but he's been in different countries, different states. And what he's seeing is just different approaches to lockdown or sheltering or whatever you want to call it. Right. So I think one of the things we may have going against us as a nation is we have every state, every city, every county kind of doing their own thing. So here in Ohio, I think we mentioned last week, we feel like we're a bit ahead of the curve um, because our governor, he's been, you know, out in front of really the rest of the nation in encouraging us to shelter in place and basically not go out. And so I think it presents a little bit of a dilemma when you have, you know, and he, he mentioned Florida's governor and he was, he was, frankly, kind of disappointed that he has, they haven't taken a little more seriously down there. And um, we just shared experiences of what we've seen, what I've seen in Ohio compared to what he's seeing in Florida. And I think we've all seen it, right? We've seen the beaches that have been packed. We've seen spring breakers not taking it seriously. So the problem is, unless we can get the whole country to unite and come together and say, okay, let's do this for a period of time, um, you know, I think it just, if you don't have people taking it seriously, it continues to spread. I think you're right. And uh, so Trump, we had this 15 days to stop the spread. He came out last weekend and um, Austin, what was the news when, when he spoke? 
Right. He, he changed. He backed down on what he was originally thinking because originally think, he was thinking he wanted the economy pretty, to be pretty much opened up by Easter. And mm-hmm. that was approaching very, very rapidly. And a lot of the health officials around the country and some of the health officials on his staff were like, that's probably not a great idea if we were to open things up that quickly. Things are not died down enough to, to be able to do that. So what he did was then instill another 30-day of stop the spread kind of plan. And that really takes us about to the end of the month um, Mm. here in April. So that's the additional guidance that was given. But what that equates to is around 45 plus or minus days of shutdown that is being recommended for the country as a whole, which is, you know, think about it, about 10% of a year. And that Mm. 10% of a year where you're not having a lot of people working, not having a lot of economic activity and output is going to have a material impact on your economy. For sure. And so that material output in the economy, the government tried to step in in a few ways, monetary policy, um, some stimulus. Um, What kind of uh, things are they trying to do to backstop this economy while we're all unemployed or not at work? So there's really three different areas that they're looking into. So first of all, is fiscal policy. So fiscal policy is the government spending. And they passed on February 27th, what was called the CARES Act. And I think we have a slide for that, where um, we actually, Josh and I, a colleague, had a podcast that we published today about the Stimulus Act and how you can get your, you know, your get your stimulus check and, and kind of the different provisions built into that. And here on the, on the screen here, we see, you know, a link to Um, to be able to listen to that. So check out that podcast at theinvesteddads.com. We kind of walk through the various provisions in that bill. And a lot of that is regarding who can expect a check, what that check will look like, how they'll get that check, when they'll get that check. And those are things that are very, very important. So uh, check that out. That's the Invested Dads podcast. So that's the fiscal side of things. That's the government spending. Let me back up there a minute. So so we have the checks going to a lot of a lot of Americans, right? Under True. certain income thresholds, which you yep. guys cover in the podcast. But not only that, we have we have um, stimulus coming to small business owners. And this is a huge deal because essentially any small business, and they define that as a business with less than 500 employees, is eligible for what they're calling a loan, okay? And the way this loan is calculated is you basically take last year, 2019, your average monthly payroll, and then you multiply the average monthly payroll by two and a half times or 250%. And so that is the maximum amount that you are eligible for. And then you can use that loan. And as long as you use it for um, over the next eight weeks after taking the loan, if you use it for payroll for employees, health insurance benefits, retirement contributions, and office rent or mortgage interest payments, they will forgive that loan. So essentially it's, it's, it's a grant from the government to small businesses so that you can get through the next eight weeks. And it's actually a decent number. If you really talk to a lot of small business owners, they are saying that this number is really gonna help them, help get them through this uh, pullback. And in, in the, now the key is in order for that loan to be forgiven, you can't lay off any employees um, over the next eight weeks. Um, The other thing that I wanna point out is if you are a small business owner, you need to take action quickly. They are actually opening up applications tomorrow morning. So Friday, April 3rd. And if you're eligible for this, um, by the way, um, you need to go to the Small Business Administration website and there's a bunch of information there on determining your eligibility but find out if you're eligible. And if you are, you want to apply immediately because it's a first come first serve. And there's a lot of questions about, can the SBA handle the volume of applications? Um, The other issue is you actually go through a lender, a bank that works with the SBA. And what we're seeing is a lot of them, they have, there's not a lot of clarity on the rules here. And so they're trying to get all of that ironed out this week and get ready for this big surge of applications but you definitely want to be first in line because I think that they're going to be hit, you know, they're going to be processing more loans than they did all of last year. And so uh, make sure you have, if you're a small business owner or an entrepreneur or 
even a, a sole proprietor, also churches. One nonprofits, of the that, right? Um, nonprofits are also eligible. So nonprofits, churches, make sure you look into this information to see if you're eligible because you want to get your application in quickly. Cool. Yeah, it's good information. Appreciate that. Um, Austin, anything else on the CARES Act or any other fiscal or monetary policy comments? Yeah, so, so the government really, like we talked about last week, has in this, instilled a open-ended quantitative easing policy from the Federal Reserve where the Federal Reserve really will, they have an unlimited amount of money, it seems like, where they can purchase all kinds of different fixed income assets to instill some stability and some liquidity in the markets. And the craziness here to me is that the Fed is feasibly able to triple its balance sheet of purchased uh, fixed income assets, assets from the pre-virus levels. So they started with around four trillion of these assets on their balance sheet. They can get that up to about 12 trillion if they use all of the lending that they have at their disposal. And this would exceed 50% of GDP, which would easily double the previous peak in 2014 when the Fed's balance sheet was 25% of GDP. So that's something we're watching closely. Also, like we see here on the slide, the Fed essentially cut rates to zero. So the, the that so that lending to banks, especially in short terms, is really, really cheap and really, really easy, which will then get passed through to businesses, to consumers um, in various ways there. So monetary policy is very, very easy and open right now. Fiscal policy has changed also as of this last or this week, President Trump has said with interest rates being nothing, this is time where we need to put together he says a $2 trillion big and bold infrastructure bill where we can borrow money very, very cheaply, put a lot of people to work and rebuild a lot of our infrastructure that's getting old and aging um, and just needs some work overall, but we'll stimulate the economy in substantial ways as well there. I will note that uh, Nancy Pelosi is really in favor of discussing this kind of phase four deal, but Mitch McConnell, which is notably you know, a Republican just like President Trump, he actually said that the Senate would be patient and not rush into discussions around a phase four deal. So I think we could see some butting of heads uh, going forward in deciding what the best path forward um, from an infrastructure side of things will be here. So basically Trump's saying while we're busy printing at the printing press, might as well print a $2 trillion I mean, more dollars. What is $2 trillion? What's another $2 trillion? No big Come on. Right. We just, we've got $6 trillion in the bu in the bucket already where we're talking about $4 trillion from the Fed and $2 trillion from the stimulus bill. Two more trillion is nothing. Come on. Not yet. It's dropping the bucket. Great, 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 great grandkids will be paying for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this morning we all woke up eight. Uh, I guess we woke up before 830, but uh, 830, the jobs report came out. Um, blew estimates out of the water in the wrong direction. Austin, yeah. what was that number estimated so, to be? And so records are great, right? No, records are not always great when it comes right. to jobless claims. And last week we had a record jobless claim number of around 3.5. 3 million new initial jobless claims. So this is, that was 3.3 million people filing for new unemployment last week. This week, the estimate was around 3.5, 3.8, depending on uh, who you talk to, million jobless claims. And the actual came in at 6.6. 6.6 million new people wow. really applied for unemployment benefits. This is double what we saw last week, which was already five times the prior record. Wow. So this figure is pretty darn close to 10 times the previous record prior to COVID-19. Wow. So that is a lot of new unemployed people that we're seeing. Um, and that 10 million workers that have filed for unemployment over the last two weeks is about 3% of the population. Wow. Yeah. Ohio so that... alone had about 500,000 new claims just last week. Okay. So, That's a I was just going to say, that's a, that's a big number, Austin. So what is yeah. that? What, how does the job market typically affect the stock market? Well, if you look here at this graph and we'll, we'll see, well, the last one and this one. So we see that the, the go back to Tony, one more slide or Adam. So we see an inverse relationship. The green or the orange is actually the S&P 500 while the white is jobless claims. And we see that when jobless claims increase, that's typically in periods where the stock market or the S&P 500, as we're talking about here, decreases. Well, we see recently on the far right there that the S&P 500, yes, has sold off substantially. We're in this bear market as we're talking about today, but jobless claims have beyond moved. They have skyrocketed to record levels. And if we look at the next, uh, the next slide, we see that there's really an inverse relationship. So if we layer 
the S&P 500 performance with an inverse, so one divided by the jobless claims, we see that they move very, very closely with one another. So this is S&P 500 in orange, an inverse chart of jobless claims in white, and jobless claims have just shot out of the water, you know, below or in, increased the wrong way uh, of bad news. And we see that in the stock market so far. And this is one of the things that keeps us feeling a little bit uh, uneasy about what's going on is because we have such worse employment figures than we have seen before. And the stock market is down a lot, but it's not down to the level that you may expect with this level of unemployment. What's kind of strange about all this is that the last two Thursdays, the market has been up on these record jobless claims numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, that the, the market was expecting a bad number. And so the question is, was it as bad as the market was expecting? I think it was today. I mean, it was at the high end of the worst case estimates. So I think today's upside is um, maybe a bit optimistic. I think we'll, you know, the market's up, but as we see more and more people file for unemployment, I think um, we're at risk of seeing the market follow that trend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. totally. And there was some other news on the market today that, that I also think drew drove it up. Um, what about the oil markets? What happened in those today? Yeah. So if you look at the next slide, we see the trend in oil this year. And this year had already started with weakened oil prices due to an oversupply around the world. But in March, in early March, things got worse. So Saudi Arabia and Russia got into an oil production disagreement with OPEC or like a conglomerate of oil producing countries who kind of plan things together. And they decided to do the opposite of what they should do. They decided to increase production and flood the world with cheap oil. And what that does, did was send oil prices down 30% overnight, I think on March 9th, um, when that happened. So that was a really, really rough day in the stock market. Um, most oil companies just tanked that day in their stocks, and it was, it was really unfortunate for oil producers. Since then, the U.S. and China both said they'd be willing to fill their strategic reserves and then even borrow some if they had to, um, to help prop up oil prices and oil demand, uh, uh, essentially there. And as of today... There are multiple reports that there is some cooperation between U.S., Russia, and Saudi Arabia to cut oil production by at least 10 million barrels per day to kind of stabilize oil prices, build some floor in there um, to the sell-off that's happened, and help the oil and gas industry overall. So tough thing there for the oil market. Indeed. All right, let's move on to uh, what you're seeing in the semiconductor space. Right. So a lot of people really thought for, and, and really still do think to this day that the Dow transports or, you know, that side of the industrial economy is the, an indicator on where the market is headed. But today in the digital world, we believe that semiconductors are really the economy's lifeblood because they're really in everything we touch, your phone, your AirPods, your watch, whatever they are, they're all, they're in all of those products, your computer. Um, so last year, they were one of the top performing sectors, and they were up over 60%, finished the year right near all-time highs. Demand for these de devices is going to be lower this year. We're all sitting at home. We're not buying new iPhones and stuff like that right now. It's tough. So that has really dropped semiconductors, which are kind of a, a leading indicator in our mind and, and have been historically. Um, they've, they've put those down about 26% from all-time highs, a little bit more than the all-time market or the, the overall market overall. So that's something we're watching. Um, but we will note that no other group has been more consistent at leading, you know, turning points in the stock market. So we want this one to take some leadership. Um, and when that happens, we'll think we're past the worst. But at this point, we really don't think semis are trucking along. So we'll be watching yeah. that going forward. Got it. Cool. Well, it is truly a grizzly bear. Adam, you've got some charts for us. Um, how, are, how are the markets behaving? What are we looking for uh, gross domestic product estimates? Well, sure. So um, the big question is the big shutdown that we've had, right? Our economy was not designed to come to a complete stop. Yeah. But what happens when it does? And um, the big question is, how big will the number be? Um, how, how, much will, how much are we expecting global domestic product, which is a measure of economic output? How big of a drawdown do we think we'll have? And so the big number will come out in Q2. Um, that's when the economy will see the hit. And as you can see on the chart here, we have forecasts all over the board, anywhere from negative 9% down to as much as 
40% drawdown in the economy. Keep in mind, this is one quarter number that is annualized. <clears throat> many, many economists are expecting to see a rebound by the time we get to Q4, so two quarters later. But this is certainly a big hit as we rarely have seen um, even a 5% drawdown, so let alone a, a 30 or 40% drawdown. Wow. Why, why are we expecting such bi a big hit to the economy? Um, well, here's a good example. I mean, take a look at theaters. Movie theaters around the country have had to shut down. And, and uh, last week, movie theaters brought in a whopping $5,000. That is crazy. Austin, was I, that you? Did you go? Did you take your family? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we went and saw movies every day. And and Finley. <laughs> Even crazier. <laughs> Compare that number to a year ago, the same week, movie theaters brought in almost $205 million. Yeah. Okay. That is a big impact to the theater industry. That's just movie theaters. You could, you could also look at hair salons, restaurants, you know, you could go all the way down the list. Um, and we're seeing big hits to different sectors in the economy. Um, we had this chart last week, but it just shows you again, if we just go with a 24% drawdown, which is Goldman's estimate, you can see how rare that is. Um, since 1950, we've only had six quarters where GDP declined by 5% or more. So that's a big number. You can see it. Um, and we're hoping we recover quickly. But I want to move on to the stock market. What's happening in the market? And where are we seeing um, maybe some opportunities? Um, let's start with where we're at today. So this is a chart as of yesterday's close. So April uh April 1st. Um, no, actually, I brought this up uh, earlier today. So anyhow, um, bottom line is that the US market is down, depending on which index you look at. The S&P 500 is down 23% year to date. The Dow is down 26, almost 27%. And the NASDAQ, which is mostly tech stocks, is down 18% year to date. Feels like a roller coaster, doesn't it? I don't know. Um, being in Ohio, I went to Cedar Point when I was a kid and one of my favorite roller coasters was the demon drop. <laughs> Anybody, have you guys ridden a demon drop? Mm -hmm. Is that, is that still around? I think I I've think renamed it. it. That know. doesn't think, seem safe. Yeah. I think they might I think they're closed it. down right now, but as soon as they reopen, we need to plan a team outing to <laughs> ride the demon drop together. There, to, go. there you go. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, what it feels like is uh, straight down. Even also interesting is, is take a look at this chart. So on the right hand side, what we're showing you are the daily percentage moves in the market. There were 22 trading days in March of 2020. Now, if we look at the percentage up, like this day was up 5% um, or down, we had one day down more than 12%. If we add up those absolute percentages, we had a cumulative move of 117 percentage points throughout the month of March. What's amazing about that is that it's well above the uh, average, um, or I'm sorry, the highest that we've ever had. So um, if you look at the, the previous high was October 2008, where the average move in a day in October 2008 was 3.8%. This month, it was 53 wow. And just to give you a sense of how dramatic those moves are, we're, we're comparing it to January of 2020. Pretty, uh, pretty big moves in the market. Um, What's also interesting is that the month of March, it included the third biggest daily loss in market history, right there. It also included the fifth biggest daily gain in market history, going back to 1915. So we've seen some big moves over the past month. It was a bumpy month. It was a bumpy month, yeah. <laughs> and not the Trump bump that we all talked about after the election, right? So after Trump was elected, we got the nice bump in the market up. Uh, I think he's hoping that we see that before uh, the next election. But uh, what we see here is a long-term trend of the S&P 500. And clearly, we had a nice positive trend line since the Great Recession. And what we've seen here is that we have went below that trend line. We retested that. And the key was 
we wanted to see the market break through that line. And what happened was that line acted as resistance or as a ceiling. And now we're back down to 2,500 on the S&P. So that means that the bear market is still in play. We have not seen a trend reversal. Last week was a good week in the market, but we've, we've basically kind of turned back a little bit this week. As a reminder, VIX is an important gauge of how volatile the stock market is. So it's the volatility index. And as you can see here, we hit an all time high in March, 82 on the VIX. We've not seen numbers like that since 2008 and rarely ever. Um, but the VIX is important when looking at bear markets. And one of the things we're looking for is we want to see a VIX rating greater than 60. The good, or I'm sorry, less than 60. Um, we see a 57 rating right now. And we also see, we want to see it below the, two, the 20 day moving average, which was 56. So we're getting to that point. We're kind of testing the waters here. And, and the reason I bring this up is it's one of those factors we look at is, is market sentiment calming down a little bit? Um, do we see the future? It's basically looking out. The VIX is telling us what the market is expecting to happen volatility wise over the next 30 days. And we want to see that calm down before we get real bullish on the market again. Uh, let's see. The next thing we're looking for. So I, we've mentioned in the past that we've been a bit defensive in our positioning right now. And you're probably picking that up with the tone of my comments, but before we can get bullish on the future of the market, we need to see some, some trends in the right direction. So the white bars on this chart are the average or the daily price moves um, since we peaked in uh, February to uh, February 19th. The market hit a low on March 23rd. It was Monday. And we saw last week a nice uh, rally in the market. But what's interesting is you see that yellow line. That yellow line is the 21 day moving average. And we never broke above that. That line has been key resistance for the market. We have to break through that line and we also have to see the market. We want to see um, these shorter term moving averages, the eight, the 21 day. We want to see the shorter time frames trading above the longer time frames. So we're seeing the exact opposite. Right now with the S&P 500 uh, closed today at 2526. Um, so right at that eight day moving average we need to see that break out above that for um, a sustainable time period. So that also keeps us cautious in the market in the short term. Another indicator we're looking at, we like to look at what percent of stocks are trading above their 200 day moving average. The 200 day moving average is an indicator that gives us the long term trend of the market. Um, the more stocks you have trading above that, the more breadth we have in the participation of the market move. And if you have a lot of stocks trading below that, you can expect the market to continue to trade lower. So right now we see a rating of 7.8%. So less 8% of stocks are trading above their 200 day moving average. That's not a good number. See this green line here. We want to see 15% or more of the New York stock exchange stocks trading above that line. Um, if we do, that's usually a good buy point. And you can see every time we kind of started trading above 15% of stocks trading above their 200 day, the market started to break out to a new uptrend. So that's another key indicator that we are looking for. Now, I want to talk about some opportunities. So just because the market is trading kind of here um, at lows and it's kind of range bound, there are opportunities in the market. And I want to talk about where those are. The first thing I want to mention is technology stocks. Um, so what you're looking at here, it's a relative strength chart. So what we're doing is we're looking at technology stocks compared to the S&P 500, the market as a whole. And if this line is rising, that means technology stocks are outperforming the broad market. And that's exactly what you see. You see, you see we've had that trend in play for quite a while. And also, that line is above its 200 day moving average and that's trending up and to the right. What that tells me is that technology stocks are continuing to outperform in this bear market. So if you're gonna own stocks, you wanna own technology stocks. 
Let's talk about the healthcare sector. It's another sector that is showing some emerging leadership. And again, we're plotting the healthcare sector against the S&P 500 market as a whole. Um, and if that is rising, that means healthcare stocks are outperforming the S&P 500. Another interesting thing is that it's, it's breaking out of this rising trend channel. And so what this is telling me is that there's a lot of opportunity in healthcare stocks today. And I think that's kind of obvious, right? We are faced with a health care scare or a health crisis. And a lot of companies that are involved in solving that crisis with vaccines or therapeutic drugs are in the healthcare space. So that's an obvious place to look for opportunities in the stock market today. Uh, let's take a look at the next chart. Let's talk about some things that aren't so strong today. So areas you might want to lighten up on or maybe, a, maybe um, be underweight on, and that would be financial stocks. So this is showing financial stocks compared to technology stocks. So we know technology is one of the strongest sectors. And this, this chart is showing you that for the past 13 years, tech stocks have outperformed financials. What's really interesting is this big declining number here which is telling me financials are really underperforming tech stocks right now. And that makes sense too, because you have record low interest rates, you have 0% rates. Um, there's questions about bank stocks. Is there any vulnerability to, you know, people defaulting on their mortgages and so forth. So that's an area that we can expect to underperform in the near future. The second area to um, maybe be a little bit light on today in this environment would be energy stocks. And as, as Austin mentioned, oil prices are, are extremely low right now mm -hmm. uh, because of the demand um, point. And this is energy stocks compared to the entire market. And what you see is a big, big decline here and not really getting any stronger. What this tells me that, you know, a lot of people ask me, should I be buying energy stocks here? I mean, they're so cheap. I haven't seen energy stocks at this level mm -hmm. in many, many years. And my answer is, Yes, they are cheap, but I think it's a bit early to be really bullish on energy stocks. We need to see more catalysts than just the valuation to turn that trend around. So I, I would be looking elsewhere for near-term opportunities. Long-term, yes, there's probably some really good buys there. I think one point with energy stocks is they might be cheap for a reason. Yeah. And the reason is that especially in a COVID-19 economy, like we're all sitting in right now, we're all mostly sitting at home, we're not driving places, oil companies aren't selling as much oil and things like that. The demand is low and it's going to be low for a while. And even when we get back to work and back to life, it's going to take some time for the global economy to pick back up the demand. So that's kind of our, our thesis on the outlook there for energy. It's, not, it's going to get better eventually, but it's not going to get better tomorrow. I would say too that we tend to suffer from uh, bias because Marathon Petroleum, which is you know a Fortune 40 company, sits right in our downtown, and um, we really like the company and they do great things for our community. Um, but from a human nature standpoint, we wanna we think that they're a great uh, investment as well. Uh, they're very exposed to the energy sector, and as Adam's pointing out, it might be a long recovery for them. Great point. All right. Well, thank you, Adam, for, the, for all that content and information. Um, I think this week, uh, our colleague, Jessica Hinks, she's a financial advisor, a CFP with us. She wrote a, a blog this week. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, Adam? Yeah. So Jessica Hinks, um, she's been publishing a blog for more than six months now. Every Thursday, she comes out with a new post. You can um, read her posts um, at the everydayadvisor.com and you can um, subscribe to her her list um, you know right down here subscribe to the everyday advisor you can also get her financial planning checklist um, Jess is a certified financial planner and she is putting out some amazing content and take a look at her recent posts here um, the last two weeks she's really focused on current uh, events. And she had a great post last week on how to exercise control during crazy times. Motivated me to up my workout game a little bit and make sure I keep things in check. From a How's that been going? Have you lost any weight? 
uh, I don't know. These, these brews aren't, aren't, you know, <laughs> not helping. Um, Counterproductive. You know, yep. Definitely is, is uh, a great stress reliever to, you know, I have a Peloton bike, so oh, yeah. I'm, I've been using that and, um, that stock speaking of stocks has seen yeah. some upward momentum because it's a, it's a great, with all the gyms closed, they're seeing a surge in orders. Um, PTON. It is. It's a, it's a, it's a, and I love it. It's, um, it's nice cause you have a screen there and you take a class and it's, it's pretty motivating. And I've been doing that now for oh two two years now. So, um, that's been good for me, but I, I will admit that going through this crisis and all the extra work we've been doing to stay on top of things, my workouts did suffer a bit. So she motivated <laughs> me to get back on track, but let me pull you to this week's one. She uh, came up with five tough questions to ask your financial advisor. Um, so I would say these are great questions that any client should be asking us if we haven't already addressed it with them. Or if you're not a client, you know, ask your advisor these questions. There's some really good ones. How does this impact my long-term plan? So, you know, a key thing is, is this event really changing your plan and your goals? You need to discuss that with your advisor. Are there adjustments you need to make to your financial plan? Um, how can you take advantage? There are opportunities. We sent clients who had traditional IRAs um, who were within a certain demographic uh, an email this week to, to point out um, that there's an opportunity for Roth IRA conversions right now while the market's low. Um, ask your advisor, what is your firm doing in response to the bear market? Um, and of course, should you be reassessing your risk tolerance? Everybody thinks their risk tolerance is high until you actually go through a situation like this and you find out, is it really as strong as you thought it was? Maybe you need to adjust your asset allocation. Um, you also want to know, you know, is your advisor personally impacted? You know, I'm, I'm most, we have personal relationships with our clients and um, that's, it's, it's important to touch base with your advisor to see, are they impacted and can they, um, are they at all, influenced by what's going on in their life and and how how is that impacting your financial plan so that's our tip of the week um read jess's blog the everydayadvisor.com good stuff i love it all right so crew brewery um hopefully you're getting toward the end of your favorite beverage if you need to refill please do so now is the time to think through any questions that you might have for the panelists here today while you think of your question, again, please type it in the Q&A box. In the meantime, before we go to the any questions, I wanted to mention that we are here to help. Um, if you're like many investors, this market um, has you unsure of what your next step should be. Um, it's our belief that most investors do better um, if they have an advisor. If you don't have an advisor, we think you should. A good financial advisor is there to coach you through times just like these. Please head on over to hzcapital.com forward slash start. Walk through our step six step process. Um, there's a tool at the bottom to schedule a meeting to see if we would be the right fit for you. All right, Austin and Adam, a couple of questions have come in. We want to start with the, a question though that we had last week that we ran out of time for. Uh, the question was, I'm going to direct this to you, Adam. Um, you've covered a lot of data on the U.S. markets, right? So we have that home country bias going on. What about international? What's going on over there? And is it a good time to invest internationally? All right. Well, I had the advantage of knowing this question was coming because it was submitted last week and we ran out of time. So I prepared a chart and I will prepare a chart for you too if you have a question for me and we don't get to it. So please submit your questions in the Q&A. Indeed. Here's the chart to answer your question, Tony. You're asking me, is now a good time to be buying international stocks or what are we expecting with international stocks? Maybe it's a better question. Um, again, we like to look at relative strength charts. It really tells us what is doing better than, than another asset class. So what I've done here is I've prepared a chart that shows you the S&P 500 versus the rest of the world. And so there's an index with a lot of acronyms, MSCI, ACWI, which stands for All Country World Index, excluding US stocks. So if we look at this chart, if it's moving positive, that means S&P is outperforming. If it's moving downward, that means international stocks are outperforming. So you can see 
in early 2000, so I, I picked a 20 year chart here just to give you some perspective. In early 2000, after the tech bubble burst and US stocks were overvalued, there was a big opportunity in international stocks and they all performed US stocks for 10 years. And by the way, these moves generally happen over long time frames. So um, when there's a big trend change, it happens over mul multiple years. Now we get to the great financial crisis and that impacted the whole world. And all of a sudden international started to underperform US and, and ever since the 2009 bottom in, in stocks, uh, US stocks have outperformed international. And as you can see, the green line is the 200 day moving average. And as long as that, again, the white line stays above that, that tells me that the long-term trend is intact and it's moving up and to the right. So if I'm a betting person, I'm betting on US stocks over international stocks in the short term. However, I will point out, international stocks are cheaper than US stocks today. But valuation alone is not a catalyst for this trend to change. And so it's important to look at multiple factors when making the decision on how to allocate your investment portfolio. So this is just one of those. And um, I'm telling you that I'm betting that U.S. continues to outperform international probably for the rest of this year. Got it. Cool. One other question we're going to take before we wrap this uh, virtual happy hour up. Um, either of you. What is your opinion on the price and the future of precious metals such as physical gold or silver? But oh, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I think that no doubt we are seeing fear impact the markets. And uh, specifically when fear impacts the markets, people rush to things that are viewed as safe havens. Um, traditionally, that has been things like gold, things like silver. Um, nowadays, sometimes that's even things like cryptocurrencies and things like that. I think that we, so gold's trading around $1,600 an ounce, and it's still not yet reached its um, 2008, 2009, 2010 peaks when it was really in demand. And I think that that's something that it, it's changed the way we look at things. Um, so gold is not necessarily as viewed as favorably maybe as it, as it used to be. But it's still going to have some upside in very, very volatile markets where it's being flocked to for its really hold of value during uh, equity market volatility specifically. That being said, in a long-term plan, uh, gold has, has a very limited kind of role where it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily earn you interest. It doesn't necessarily grow as, as a company's profits would. Um, so I think that over the long term, it has a little bit different perspective than in the short term. It can, it can have some uses, but it's not something that we typically are, are the most bullish about, um, especially being that, you know, U.S. businesses are going to recover. And that's something we're very, very confident in. It's just a matter of time. That being said, it has, its, it has outperformed equities in the short term, and it, it typically does in this kind of time we're in right now. Cool. Yeah. Love it. Adam, do you, it sounds like you wanted to say something. Well, uh, I don't know. If, can you see it on my screen? I'm showing yeah. a yep. chart of gold. And what you can see here is back in 2008, 2009, and Austin hit the nail on the head. Gold is a fear asset. So when fear is at its highest, gold will outperform other securities many times. So um, what you're seeing here is an upward rise in gold from 2008 until about 2012, late 2011. And then you see a big downtrend and a leveling off. But now you, you do see some appreciation in gold and this is a monthly chart. But if, you know, so if fear continues to increase, I think in the short term, gold might do okay. But my big question is how much gold do you really wanna own? <clears throat> because gold is not an income producing asset. A stock is, you know, companies do produce income many of them pay dividend. And so gold is a really hard asset to value. And I think really gold is just a speculation prep play is like, how do you, you know, so you might, you know, it might not hurt to own a little bit of gold in an environment like this, but I sure wouldn't bet the farm on gold outperforming stocks over the long run. Uh, this is just a chart that shows you kind of like the last six months, 
the white bars are the daily price movement, which you can see it's been kind of volatile. Um, but it, it is trying to break out a little bit. And I think um, it might have a chance at having some appreciation this year. But uh, again, it doesn't play a major role in our portfolios. I think one mm-hmm. other thing to consider is that there have been very, very sharp downturn days in the stock market that gold has actually been sold off as well this year as investors have preferred cash over precious metals in a lot of instances, and it's specifically in this bear market we're in right now. And that is counterintuitive to what you would expect in a precious metal like that. So I think that's probably another reason why it hasn't just taken off like it maybe have in the past, because cash is king. Excellent point. Indeed. Well, we have come to the end of our virtual happy hour. Thank you so much for your attendance for your participation in today's call. Remember, as long as we are in this grizzly bear, we will be meeting Thursdays at 4 p.m. for a virtual happy hour. In the meantime, if you want to contact us, email us any questions or thoughts at bmb at hzcapital.com. We would love your feedback, suggestions, or questions. We'll get through this together. Join us each week. Tell a friend. Remember, if we get 1,000 subscribers, Austin will sing us bear market blues on behalf of adam austin and i am tony hickson sending you virtual cheers remember the best is ahead thank you very much we will see you next week goodbye